Howdy, AP Precal. It's Miss Kasha, and we are beginning the AP Precal version of polynomials. How we're gonna, how we're gonna discuss and understand polynomials. Um, I went to print my a copy of the notes so that I could write on top of it, and apparently the uh, maybe the toner is cut out or doing whatever. Anyway, it looks like this. My apologies. Um, it won't look like that for you electronically. But one, I didn't feel like going back to my computer and hitting print again and then walking all the way back to get the printout. Two, I didn't want to use more paper. Look at me being environmentally friendly. And three, the art teacher said it was pretty. So I digress. Here we go. Let's jump in and get started. Um, so with this one, they're telling us a polynomial function. Um, a, a function is a polynomial when we have x to different um, positive integer values or um, actually this one would technically have x to the zero power, and that could be a polynomial. Um, but we wouldn't have an x to the negative exponent. Or like, if I said y is equal to x to the negative 1, this is the same thing as 1 over x. This is a rational function. It's not a polynomial. OK, so that's no good. We wouldn't have, um, we wouldn't have something like y is equal to x to the 1 half, for example. That is a. So the square root of x, that's a radical. So, um, uh, yeah, we wouldn't use, we don't call them radicals. What are they? Uh, well, it's a square root function in this case, or it's a, um, wow, okay. I mean, they're radicals. Maybe that's what we would call them. Anyway, different kind of function, not what we're talking about here. So these polynomials, all the exponents have to be uh, positive integers or zero. Okay, so the leading term is this a sub n to the um x to the n, uh, the degree is n. The leading coefficient is that a sub n. So basically, they're just kind of lab labeling them that way. Uh, it's just the math notation. OK, let's jump into a little bit more interesting. The leading coefficient is we look for the largest exponent. The degree of that largest exponent is 4. The leading coefficient was 3. Here on this one, we switched up the order just to make sure you were paying attention. Leading coefficient is a negative 7. The degree was 3. Leading coefficient is 4. The degree would be 0. OK, now on this one, sorry, you can't read all of this, but it says the extrema of a graph are the max and min of a function. There are two types of extrema. OK, and so you have local. You could also call them relative. Oh, ha, huh, they did right there. Relative extrema are also local. Absolute extrema, extrema are also global. So the relative is it's on a particular area of the graph. It is um, the, lo the, the relative in, in this, like in this, we're living in this world and we have a maximum. We're living in this world and we have a minimum. We're living in this world, we have a maximum, that sort of situation. OK, so on this one, we have, and notice they have this endpoint. The endpoint could also be, um, Max or, like they could be relative max or mins. So it's the same graph that shows up twice in this um, graph for us. But there's, it's hard to see in the video, but this is an arrow. OK, so you think, oh, this is an absolute max. It's the smallest anywhere in the whole thing. But this arrow tells us it keeps going down. Um, OK, local minimums means, OK, well, right here happened at negative 4. That's the minimum in this area. This one at uh, when x was negative 4. This one, it also has a local minimum here at when x is 0. The local max, it had a maximum here at negative 2. It also had a max at positive 3. Absolute minimums, well, because of this arrow, it goes down forever and ever and ever and ever. There's none. You could tell me none. You could tell me Na. I don't really care. But somehow you need to indicate that there is not an absolute minimum. The absolute maximum is the biggest thing, biggest it ever gets. So. It happens when x is equal to 3. OK, <laughs> more colorful. OK, between two real zeros of a polynomial, there must be at least one. OK, so what's happening here is if I have, well, let's look back at this graph. I had a 0 here. I had a 0 here. I have a 0 here. I have a 0 here. So they're saying between any two, there has to be at least one. Well, in this case, there's a maximum. And between these two, there's at least one. In this case, it's a minimum. So between these two, we had a maximum. So basically what's happening, you can't have a 0 and a 0 without going up and turning around. You could kind of think of it that way if it's a polynomial function. Um, you could have, it could bounce on the, on the axis. Um, 
but it would still have that, but that's just one zero and not two. Okay, so notice on this, between any two, there is at least one. Um, it could do more. We could have a situation where we have, we kind of come up and then turn around and then do all sorts of things and then, and then come down like this. So this would have had a, a, a local or max, here's a local min, here's a, this could be local or absolute, I don't know, it depends on what else is happening. But we've got a few before this zero here and this zero there. But it's gonna tell us there's at least one. Okay, so between two real zeros of a polynomial, there must be at least one max or min. Polynomials of even degree must have either an absolute absolute max or an absolute min. Okay, so if it's an even degree, then it would look something like this. It's going to have a lowest value, and now that lowest value could show up twice. Um, but if it keeps going up, so this would have an absolute minimum value. If it's going something like this and going, say it's going down forever here, this would have an absolute maximum value. Okay, the next one, point of inflection. I don't ever write POI, but okay, maybe I, AP does, we'll see. Um, occurs when a function changes from concave up to concave down, or from concave down to concave up. So on this one, it looks concave up, and then here it looks concave down, and here it looks concave up. So in calculus, they're gonna teach you how to find those points of inflection, but in pre-cal, we, we wanna start using them, but we're just gonna kind of assume that it's where we expect it to be here. Um, partly, I can't do any more than that because I don't know the equation, so even if I did know the calculus, it's hard for me to, because um, I don't know exactly where this is crossing. Anyway, those seem to be the points of inflection. Uh, okay, find any values of x where g has an inflection point. Okay, so that's when x is equal to, in this case, plus or minus 1. Here's minus 1, there's plus 1. For each of the following intervals, determine if the rate of change of g is increasing or decreasing. Okay, so from 3 to four, the graph is concave up. The rate at which it's, the, so the slope here would be getting steeper and steeper if I were looking at little pieces here. Um, so this is, um, if the rate, okay, hang on. Let me make sure I answer the right question. Determine if the rate of change of G is increasing or decreasing. It's increasing because it's concave up. This one from negative th four to positive three. I wonder if this was intended to, in this case, we are concave up, concave down, concave up. So kind of both, but I wonder if that was a typo. It wouldn't surprise me if they had intended to say from negative four to negative three. If that's what they said, negative four to negative three, this is concave up. So it's um, increasing because the slope is becoming less negative. So you're better off if you owe me less money. Um, so anyway. Okay, so from negative one to positive one, this is concave down. So the rate of change is decreasing. From one to two, this is concave up, so it's increasing. I think I wrote a little bit more on each of these on my answer key, so if you wanna go look at that, that's not a bad idea. Okay, well, we lost color and now we have a lovely stripe down our page, my apologies. Um, okay. So an even function has symmetry over the y-axis. I think I wrote that wrong. I'll have to go look at my notes. Is that right? Yeah. Anyway, it folds. So whatever's in quadrant one shows up in quadrant two. Whatever's in quadrant four shows up in quadrant three and the opposite. Um, so we're going to do an algebraic proof for all of these to determine what's happening. Um, an odd function is symmetric about the origin. So anything up here or this point would reflect and kind of come, so this is like one half, negative two. So at negative one half, I lied, one and a half, negative one and a half uh, is now positive two. So this has kind of rotated around the origin right there. Um, here's the way that we'll do a proof. And this, this is exactly what I want to see on your paper. You'll tell me h of negative x so we're trying, they gave us h of x. We're trying to see what happens when I plug in a negative x. So this is 2 times negative x to the fourth minus negative x squared plus 5. Okay, well, if I have four negatives, so a negative times a negative is a positive, a negative times a negative is a positive, a positive times a positive is still positive, this is a positive 4x, 
I lied, 2x to the fourth. This, a negative squared is positive. There's still a negative here. And then I have plus 5, nothing happened. This expression right here is exactly h of x. Okay, and so this is the proof that I want to see. We just set up here that when f of negative x equals f of x, this is an even function. So this one, when I put uh, h of negative x was exactly equal to h of x, this is an even function. I would want to see every single step here. So um, this, think of this as a little bitty, a little bitty proof. Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, basically what's happening is if I look at my x values, so anything that shows up over here, if it has this y value, then the corresponding over here would have that same y value. And so it would give us symmetry over the y-axis. Okay, that's what I want to say. Next one, b of negative x is equal to 2 times negative x to the fifth minus 3 times negative x. Okay, so on this one, a negative to the fifth power is a, is a negative. So this becomes negative 2x to the fifth. A negative times a negative is a positive right here. Well, now let's see what happens. If I factor out a negative, I get that expression. This is exactly equal to what I started with. So this is equal to negative b of x. And when, well, g of negative x equals negative g of x, when b of negative x equals negative b of x, that mean, then we have an odd function. And so that's the proof I'd be looking for there. Um, this next one, let's see. Um, k of negative x is equal to negative x cubed plus 3 times negative x minus 1. This gives us a negative x cubed minus 3x minus 1. If I factor out the negative, Um, x cubed plus 3x plus 1, x cubed plus 3x minus 1. This is, this is not what I started with, and it's not exactly opposite of what I started with. We will say neither. Okay. Last one here. I see that this one appears to have symmetry um, around, so it's kind of rotated around the, um, the origin. So if I'm at positive, whatever I had at positive 1, ends up was a negative y value. Well, negative 1 had that positive of the same y value. So this would be an odd function. This one has symmetry over this line. So I've got symmetry over the line x equals 1, but that doesn't mean anything. This is neither. I mean, there's symmetry, but it's just not the correct kind of symmetry. Okay, what do we have next? End behavior. You know what? I'll make another video on that. So come back and find that one. Go practice. Good luck.